I worked for 16 years as a nurse practitioner in cardiology. I saw the net impact of metabolic inflexibility and poor metabolic health. And that is why I'm so passionate about talking to people and patients about metabolic flexibility. So we're gonna take a little journey, we're gonna do a little bit of statistics, I promise we will, we will emphasize the gender differences, but there's a lot of information I think is equally as important, and so that's a lot of the focus today. Okay, I love quotes. The best of all medicines is resting and fasting. Obviously, Ben Franklin has been deceased for a long time, but fasting is not new or novel. Unfortunately, our culture would like us to believe that this is something that is new and fresh. And I remind people it dates back to biblical times. This has been part of us from an ancestral health perspective for thousands of years. Okay. What I like to speak about is this public health crisis that we're dealing with. It is important, not just for clinicians, but every one of us to focus in on the fact that one billion people worldwide are obese. According to the World Health Association organization, rates have tripled since 1976. 42% of Americans are obese, exacerbated by the pandemic. I was looking at these statistics when I was making these slides, and has increased by 26% since 2008. A survey by the American Psychological Association pandemic averaged 30 pounds of weight gain. With a median of 16 pounds, and 10% of us gain more than 50 pounds, largely due to sleep disturbances and alcohol use. Let that kind of be absorbed. The last two years have really impacted us profoundly on every single level imaginable. When we talk specifically about the United States, we have this metabolic health status. 37.9% of men, 41.1% of women, in the U.S. are obese, twice as many as three decades ago. 20% of children, 20% of children are overweight, three times as many as three decades ago. When I was growing up, a thousand years ago, back in the 70s and 80s, you didn't see obese children. You really didn't. In 2020, 16 states in the United States had adult obesity rates greater than 35%. 173 million Americans are, di are pre-diabetic, many of whom do not know. 130 million Americans are insulin resistant or diabetic. 25% of Americans have something I call nofl D, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. High blood pressure is, excuse me, high blood sugar is linked to eight out of, top, of the top 10 leading causes of death and when you look at the statistics and you look at where people are most vulnerable, there are systemic and social inequity, inequities. I trained in inner city Baltimore. You better believe the statistics for inner city Baltimore are very different than they are for affluent parts of the United States. I don't want this to be all negative. I just want to provide some basis for why metabolic flexibility is something we should all strive for. So when we're looking for markers, so if you're sitting in the audience, you probably have heard of something called metabolic syndrome. Obviously in cardiology, that was my bread and butter. So we know that there's, there are gender differences that impact metabolism, and we'll talk about those shortly. We know that there is a global prevalence of more men than women that have type 2 diabetes. When you're looking at markers, so when you go to your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your PA, and you're doing your annual exam, these are things that you need to be looking at and asking for. And hopefully if you're in this room, you probably already have a great relationship with a provider. So if you are metabolically unhealthy, if you have metabolic syndrome, your HDL, if you're a man, is less than 40. For a woman, it's less than 50. Your triglycerides, are going to be greater than 150. This is important because more often than not in cardiology, I'd be looking at lipid panels with patients and I would talk to them if their triglycerides were 300, 400, 500. Higher than that, we start worrying about pancreatitis and I would ask them, what types of processed carbohydrates are you consuming? 
it's not a sweet potato that's going to give you high triglycerides. It's processed crap. I know uh, Dr. Ken Berry is going to be speaking tomorrow, and I know he talks a lot about this, but it's sodas and pastries and cookies and cake and things like that that are going to really elevate those triglycerides. If your fasting glucose is greater than 100 or your fasting insulin, in my estimation, is greater than 6, you want to really be focused in on this. High blood pressure defined right now is 130 over 85. And if your waist circumference as a man is greater than 45 inches or greater than 35 as a woman, this is a sign that you more than likely have got some degree of metabolic inflexibility. Okay, so how did this happen? This didn't just happen overnight. And as a clinician over more than 20 years of practicing, I've seen a lot of changes that have impacted us on a profound level. So we talk about the rise of the processed food industry. It's a $100 trillion per year with $450 billion in profit. They are not looking out for anyone. No one. They are profit-focused. They are not health-focused. Our portions have gotten bigger. I call it portion distortion. Oftentimes, when you leave the United States, maybe we haven't been able to do that as much over the last several years. You look at other countries. When a meal is served to you, it's half the size of what you get in restaurants. We're becoming more sedentary. One in four Americans sits greater than eight hours a day. My greatest pain point, meal frequency, snacks and mini meals. We've been taught, we've been telling our patients for years, eat to stoke your metabolism. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You need to eat three meals a day and snacks in between to stabilize your blood sugar. Consumption of highly processed foods including seed oil. Seed oils are vegetable oils, canola oil. You think about soybean oil, sugar and soy. And frankly, a lack of prioritization for nutrition research by the federal government has not helped things. And I'm gonna talk about one strategy that can help all of this. Who in here already intermittent fasts? Awesome. Okay. So why fasting is invaluable for metabolic health? Now, many of you might be looking at the mitochondria graphic that's on here and saying, I have no idea what this is. Our mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells. They get damaged over time. If you're north of 40 years old, you very likely have dysfunctional mitochondria. But fasting is one of many ways that we can improve the mitochondria. When we fast, we actually will use the ability, once we're metabolically flexible, we will be able to tap into fat stores for energy. We use the term fat oxidation, but the way, it's kind of layman's way of looking at it is it helps you burn fat. And it's, there's a really cool way of looking at fat. Fat isn't just fat. Fat is this incredibly sophisticated inflammatory process. Now, most adipose or fat tissue is white fat, but we can actually transition fat from the white fat that's inflammatory and non-beneficial, we can actually make it brown fat, which is metabolically active. And we can do that while fasting. I know that um, Dr. Lesky already talked about the importance of the gut microbiome. Well, fasting is critically helpful and beneficial for gut health. So we talk about it helps with the gut microbiome balance, aligns with circadian biology. One thing that I didn't touch on is that we have we have circadian clocks, not just in our brain, but throughout our gut. This is why eating within three hours of bedtime is not particularly helpful, not only for sleep, but also for blood sugar, because we become more physiologically insulin resistant as the day goes on. So I always talk about how fasting can be very beneficial for aligning with chronobiology. We know that fasting helps with the small intestine. We have this amazing system called the migrating motor complex in our guts that the only way that it is really working efficiently, it kind of works like a sweet sweeper. The best way that it works is when we are not eating with meal frequency. It actually needs four to five hours for it to work properly. We know it also, our gut microbiome is critically important for neurotransmitter. Um, our last speaker, we heard her talking about how she had crippling depression, even as a child and young adult. And so the gut microbiome is critically involved with neurotransmitter production, serotonin, dopamine, etc. We know that you know, when we help to enhance the mitochondrial function, it improves our energy. So many people, when they're new to intermittent fasting, will say, I came to intermittent fasting to change body composition. I came to lose weight, but I stayed because I felt so damn good.